Trump likes to sue people, he should sue whoever did that to his face. I call him Little Marco. He's a nice guy. <laughs> He's like 6'2", which is why I don't understand why his hands are the size of someone who's 5'2". <laughs> and you know what they say about men with small hands? I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. Thank God he has really large ears, the biggest ears I've ever seen. Then he asked for a full-length mirror. I don't know why, because the podium goes up to here, but he wanted a full-length mirror. Maybe to make sure his pants weren't wet. I don't know. He was putting on makeup with a trowel. Donald is not going to make America great. He's going to make America orange. Well, let's hear it, Big Don. Don't worry about it, little Marco. I have never seen any human being sweat like this guy. It's Rubio! The Republican race has turned into a comedy roast. And the way things are going, Donald Trump could get the last laugh. The establishment Republicans are all, you know, bedwetting over this. Marco Rubio is our special guest tonight, and we'll ask him about his strategy heading into Florida. We're going to win here in Florida. We're going to continue to fight across the country because if Donald Trump's our nominee, we're going to lose. Plus, our contributor and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Charlie Leduff joins us in studio with an inside look at the next big race in Michigan. Dude! What was that? Plus, our pollster Matt Towery and Republican strategist Adam Goodman reveal their projections for next week. And in our parody segment, we show how historians may describe the political war of 2016 to our kids. Bless your heart, Nikki Haley. War is hell. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover, and we'll start with Senator Marco Rubio. Senator Rubio, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. In August, you agreed to support whoever gets the Republican nomination. Do you still stand by that pledge, given the growing possibility, at least, that Trump could win this and you say that he's a con man? Yeah, well, he's not going to win the nomination. It would be a catastrophe for the Republican Party, and uh, that's why I continue to fight so hard. We're going to win here in Florida. We're going to continue to fight across the country because if Donald Trump's our nominee, we're going to lose. We're going to lose badly, and we're going to lose the conservative movement. I mean, this is a guy who supports Planned Parenthood. This is a guy who says he won't take sides when it comes to Israel. So your question is, I'm going to support the Republican nominee because it's not going to be Donald Trump. It's going to be me. Now, it's going to be a hard fight. Florida is going to be key. I think if we win Florida, we'll be very difficult to stop ourselves, but we have to win here. We're going to work really hard to do it. And you said that you got into the trash talk with Trump to give him a dose of his own medicine, but when you make fun of his hands or the color of his skin, regardless of what he said, does that not just lower the bar even more? Yeah, and it's unfortunate that that's what politics has become about. You look at Donald Trump has gotten 10 times as much coverage as any candidate, all the other candidates combined because he spent a year insulting people. That's not going to be the core of our campaign. You're not going to hear me saying that all the time. But when you're a, a bully like Donald Trump, every now and then someone has to give you a taste of your own medicine. This guy has mocked everyone from the disabled to women to minorities. Uh, is this what we really want to be identified as the Republican Party? This is a guy that for three days refused to condemn the Ku Klux Klan or David Duke. I mean, there's no place for that in the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln and Reagan. How can he be our nominee? He won't be. We're not going to stick around and watch Donald Trump continue to, you know, poke people in the face and have no one respond to him. And to that end, in your speech, you said you started to take down Trump just a few days ago. Why would you wait until just a few days ago when at this point it could be too late for any Republican yeah. to bring him down? Yeah, it's not too late. I mean, Donald, I mean, the question is, how does Donald Trump get the delegates he needs to win the nomination? Because the resistance to him is extraordinary. In Virginia, he was meeting me by 20 points. He ended up basically winning by less than three points. I think if we'd had one more week, we would have overtaken him there. Look, Florida's going to be big. Florida's always big. It's big again. It's 99 delegates. It's the biggest chunk of delegates that's going to be awarded by any single state up until this point. We need everyone's help. If you want to stop Donald Trump, I'm the only one that can do that in Florida and across the country. But to your key challenge, you said that if you did not have to share the ballot with two or three other people, you would have won Virginia, maybe elsewhere. But can't the same be said for the two yeah. or three other people? You look at the other people that we're talking about, they're asterisks, you know, they're small percentages, but just enough to make a difference. 
you know, and, and, uh, and, but look, I can't control that. I'm not asking anyone to do anything. We're just going to have to do better, and we will. Florida's critical. People watching this right now, they have to understand that the future of the conservative movement and the Republican Party is going to be in their hands here in Florida. Uh, if we win, we're going to have a real chance, not just to win the nomination, but to keep it from falling into the hands of a con artist like Donald Trump, who is not a conservative and has never voted in a Republican primary in his entire life. So are you then in this race until somebody mathematically clinches it no matter what? Yeah, that, and, and I, we want it to be us, obviously. You know, we want to get to 1,237 delegates. I do not believe Donald Trump will ever get 1,237 delegates. If you extrapolate what's happened now across the states that are remaining, it won't happen. And we feel like the map now, the states that are now coming up, those are much better for us than, than some of the other states that have voted so far. You know, so we, we feel good. It's going to be a tough ride. This, look, I'm an underdog. There's no doubt about it. But I've been an underdog my entire career and my entire life. It's, it's a role that I relish. And quite frankly, it's a, it's, it's a role that I think is important in this election because the front runner is someone who will get crushed by Hillary Clinton. And we cannot allow Hillary Clinton to be the next president of the United States. Senator Rubio, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so let's now bring in Adam Goodman, Republican strategist. Let's talk about Marco Rubio pledging to support the winner of the Republican race, even if it's Donald Trump. And yet he calls Donald Trump a con man, not just any con man, the pulling off the biggest con of all, he claims, who would destroy the conservative movement. And yet he says, yeah, I'd, I'd support him if he gets the nomination. How does that add up? Uh, these are interesting times, aren't they, Craig? I mean, you're seeing uh, thing, conventional rules being broken almost by the day in this particular campaign. At the end of the day, Marco and others, if Donald Trump is the nominee, will fold in by saying he is preferable to the alternative, and uh, we all assume to be uh, Hillary Clinton. That's how they get through that. The positive part of this, that there is a positive silver lining, is that I think it's healthy that on um, both sides, by the way, not just Republicans but Democrats, are opening it up. They're opening this whole thing up so the party itself is maybe in less control and the people are in more control. You see Bernie Sanders, Craig, pushing on the left, uh, saying that the superdelegate rules are unfair. They are. I mean, why do you... He wins Colorado by 19 points and ends up with the same number of delegates as Hillary. On the Republican side, they're saying we, we the people want to make this call and not the party elders. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, played out in this drama. In Florida, polling showing Trump presently up around 20 points. Let's say the polls are wrong. Let's say it's only 10 points that Trump is up because early and mail-in voting has already started. In that scenario, even if he's only up 10 points, has Rubio already lost? Rubio has two, at least two problems or two challenges. One is, as you know, a lot of vote was cast while Jeb Bush was still technically on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, a lot of ballots came in early, early, early voting that are going to be votes, say, for Jeb and maybe for Carson now that cannot be counted as uh, towards an alternative to uh, to uh, to Donald Trump. Number two is uh, I think there are other candidates in this field. I think Kasich, for instance, did very well in the Fox debate. Uh, I think there are, people are starting to consider maybe he is an alternative as well to Donald Trump. And of course, Ted Cruz, after a decent uh, Super Tuesday, comes in with a little bit of momentum as well. I think if it were a one-on-one -on -one race, we'd have a wholly different result in the state of Florida than a one-on-three race. And I think still you have to say Trump is looking pretty good. And at this point, your prediction, therefore, would be Trump, Florida? I think it's going to be a close election, but I'd have to say Donald Trump. Adam Goodman, thank you for your insight. Thank you, Greg. Coming up, Charlie LaDuffy is in the house, and he'll give us an inside look at the races in Michigan and Florida. Okay, Florida weighs in on March 15th, but the next key state to watch is Michigan on Tuesday. Voters are angry in that state, and Charlie LaDuff knows why. When you get down to it, government's supposed to do some basic things. Water, roads, schools. In Michigan, the government can't seem to manage any of it. And the people are angry. Consider. Politicians, both Democrat and Republican, decided Flint should help build a new water system. Contractors got paid, politicians got contributions, and the people of Flint got poisoned water. Republican Governor Rick Snyder is peddling the unbelievable. He didn't know. The cleanup will cost millions of dollars we don't have. The Detroit Public Schools will run out of money next month thanks to cratering enrollment and graft. 
But politicians aren't talking about revamping standards and curriculum. They're talking about clawing the taxpayers for a half billion dollar bailout they can't afford. In the meantime, those same politicians, both Democrat and Republican, voted to spend millions of public dollars to build a pro hockey arena that could have been used for the Detroit public schools. Michigan's unemployment rate dips again. It fell to employment has rebounded in Michigan, but it's mostly low paying stuff like wiping old people's bottoms. The car companies are doing better and auto workers recently got pay raises in exchange for agreeing to more factory jobs going overseas. Detroit recently emerged from bankruptcy and there's now a Whole Foods in downtown. And that's good. But there's still a gigantic hole of basic services in the neighborhoods. And that's bad. And so the people of Michigan look to Washington for answers. But it seems it's just as rotten there. Turns out they knew about Flint's water in Washington, too. And no one said a word. Well, it sure doesn't show it to me. Because this election is about special interests versus the public's interests. A future for our children or a fortune for a few. It goes beyond party politics and rehearsed sound bites. But that's all we ever get. The candidates are coming to Michigan to debate, and that's great. It's nice to be considered something more than a punchline to a national joke. They'll come to Michigan to talk, but talk like politics is cheap. Maybe be better if they just came and listened. Because it's not too late in America. And here he is in person. Charlie, thank you for joining us here in studio after all these years from hundreds of miles away. Well, it's what easy when you send the corporate jet. Thanks for thanks Okay, for well, I just sometimes you have to do something special <laughs> for Charlie. So let's start with Michigan. You know Michigan well. That's your home turf. We have the primary coming up just around the corner. How do you see this? Without looking at a single poll and just talking to regular people, it's going to be Donald Trump for the Republicans. It's going to be Hillary Clinton for the, uh, for the Democrats. It's pretty simple math, I think. What issues drive voting behavior in Michigan? Like everywhere else, jobs, jobs, and money. You've spent a few days with us here in Florida, so I'm interested in your perspective. You're going to bring it to us next week on the Americans traveling along the I-4 corridor. How does it compare and how does it differ from what you see in Michigan? It's much more diverse. It's uh, much more populated and dense, but uh, it's really the same. I mean, let, let me look at it as how is it different from the United States. It reminds me New York to LA and everything in the middle. The Puerto Ricans, working class white people, working class black, wealthy retirees, you name it, it's here. And the common thread is everybody is frustrated and everybody's angry at the political process and the political parties, regardless of which party you line up with. You've spent a lot of time covering issues relating to race relations. You stopped by Sanford. What struck you on your visit the most? Oh, uh, it was the week of the anniversary of uh, the four-year anniversary of the Trayvon Martin shooting, and what's it was eerie because it's an integrated, gated community, but it's taboo to talk about it there. You, something so big, something that's unleashed something even greater in the country, the neighbors don't talk about it. But two young men, both named Joshua, one white, one black, 15 years old, they spoke about it. They spoke about it frankly, and you know what it did for me? It made me feel good about the future, about the kids we're bringing up. There are men in waiting, and you're going to see that whenever you guys decide to air it. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us in person. Look forward to your work next week. Yeah, okay, thanks for having me. It's real cool. Thanks, Florida. <laughs> Coming up, our pollster Matt Towery has nailed it in state after state, and he'll show us how the polls are now shifting and what it means. Donald Trump likes to sue people. He should sue whoever did that to his face. Thank God he has really large ears, the biggest ears I've ever seen. Don't worry about it, little Marco. I will. All right, well, let's hear big, oh. big Don, you know, Donald. Don't worry about it, All little, right, don't worry about it hey, little Marco. Gentlemen. Okay, let's bring in our pollster, Matt Towery. Matt, in all of your years, with all the name calling, the comedy roast, this Republican race has turned into reality check. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, I never have. Never thought I would. It's, it's reality TV brought to politics. And so you've got Donald Trump calling Rubio little Marco. You've got Marco making fun of the size of Trump's hands and the size of his, well. Have you seen his hands? You know what they say about men with small hands. Who benefits from this and who hurts the most, do you think, in the next round of polls? The attacks on Trump 
didn't really stop him in most places. And in, in reality, uh, some of the internal polling told us that the attacking, the fighting back and forth was benefiting other candidates like John Kasich, who, who uh, you know, was polling in the double digits going into this in some states like Georgia. So what I'm thinking is that they're either all going to have to adjust their style or this thing is just going to stay the way it is coming into Florida. And how important do you think Florida is going to be the way these cards are stacked? I think Florida decides it all. I think, quite frankly, that if Trump were to carry Florida, the Republican Party is now the Trump Party. I think if Trump were not to carry Florida, it would be the beginning of, of a demise. I think it's that important. Matt Towery, as always, thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, Florida's the jackpot on March 15th, and a lot of people have already cast ballots. So Evan Axelbank shows us how it's playing out. To find out why Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump did so well on Super Tuesday, you only had to visit early voting sites here in Tampa Bay. First, Hillary Clinton. She swept the five Super Tuesday states in the South, winning 80% of black voters. We spoke to Tampa Air Force vet Annette Jenkins. She said nostalgia she has for the Clinton presidency hasn't worn off one bit. When he left office, we had so much money. And then when the Bushes came in, we lost all that money. I don't even know what happened to it. We also spoke to Pastor Rick Rollins, who also felt the Clinton nostalgia. Now, he considered voting for Bernie Sanders based on the issues. But in the end, he just couldn't because to him, she seemed like a safer choice. My gut says Hillary all day long, so uh, I think I'm going to go with my gut. If Hillary Clinton benefited from nostalgia and portrayed herself as a safe choice, Donald Trump benefited from the opposite. Voters I spoke to like Trump for his insistence on smashing the system and being different. He speak to me. He's an open book. He's, he speak the truth. Katya Watelski is an immigrant from Peru who just became a citizen, and she says Trump's talk about walling off the southern border appeals to her. She says she never would have been involved if he wasn't in the race, which is a core part of the Trump argument. I live paycheck by paycheck. I'm a single mother with two kids. He's really talking about the middle class. For now, it's two different races that the two frontrunners hope will become one race soon. For Money, Power, and Politics, I'm Evan Axelbank. Coming up in our parody segment, with the Republican Party at war, we turn the race into a war documentary. The Great Republican War of 2016 defined us and opened us up to what we became. Well, with Trump and Rubio tearing each other apart, and Romney declaring war on Trump and Republican leaders in a state of panic, we wondered how historians may describe all of this to our kids. And so in tonight's Trail Tales, in the spirit of Ken Burns, we came up with this. It's time now for Trail Tales. On the cornfields of Sharpsburg, a soft-spoken surgeon tried to heal his war-torn party with gifted hands and sleepy words. What kind of judgments have they made? The fruit salad of their life is what I will look at. Lieutenant Benjamin Carson. P.S. Would somebody please attack me? It was too late. For the wounds had festered through a fortnight, and the party forged by Lincoln was plunging back into the furnace. My party is going bash crazy. Well, let's hear it, Big Dog. Don't worry about it, Little Marco. Little Marco Rubio, this guy that, that uh, he's going around, he's going crazy. The Great Republican War of 2016 defined us and opened us up to what we became. It was a crossroads of our being, and it was a hell of a crossroads. The cold insults have chilled me to the bone. How I long for the insepid comfort of mint. General Rents Priebus. The brash general from New York cleared through a dozen states with ruthless abandon and showed no mercy as he tore through the South. I'd like to punch him in the face. Throw him out into the cold. No coats. 
No coach. Mr. Trump, the cheek of every American must tingle with shame. For all I can muster in the way of a comeback is bless your heart, Nikki Haley. The party establishment bucked their swaggering frontrunner and embraced a young man from Florida who promised to focus the war on issues and substance. And so, General Rubio accused his rival of peeing his pants. He doesn't sweat because his pores are clogged from the spray tan that he uses. He's going to make America orange. Guy, he's taller than me. He's like 6'2", which is why I don't understand why his hands are the size of someone who's 5'2". And you know what they say about men with small hands? I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee it. War changes men forever. War is hell. For I fear holding this party together may be the biggest lost cause of all. General Rince Priebus. Oh, <clears throat> all right, we have other chapters of trail tales that you may have missed, but you can watch all of them on our Facebook page. Search for Fox 13's Craig Patrick on Facebook. Like our page, then check out the video section. You'll also find investigations, prior shows, and you'll also find the link to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So we still have a lot of ground to cover. This is the end of our show. We're looking forward to Michigan next week and, of course, Florida on March the 15th. Live results as they come in. We'll also see you next week here on Money Power Politics.